Hello. I'd like to welcome all of you to the Tocqueville Project's 2014-2015 Adams and Reese Lecture in Legal Thought. I'm Chris Serpenon, Assistant Professor of Philosophy here at the University of New Orleans and Director of the Tocqueville Project. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Tocqueville Project, it was established to examine the enduring questions in the history of Western moral and political thought. To further that mission, we support academic seminars and reading groups, fund student and faculty scholarship, and put on public debates, panel discussions, and lectures like tonight's event. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to take a moment to thank a number of people and organizations that have made tonight's event and really everything we do here at the University of New Orleans possible. First, my thanks to our affiliated faculty members, including two that are here tonight. Frank Shalo, Professor of Philosophy and University Research Professor here at UNO, and Salman Shomade, Associate Professor of Political Science here at UNO. Also, my thanks to the Tocqueville Project Advisory Board, including two that are here tonight, Joseph Looney, a partner at the law firm of Adams and Reese, and Kevin Stewart, President and CEO of Ted Lee Stewart Media Partners. Next, I would like to thank the law firm of Adams and Reese, who has provided us with considerable support, including the funding to support this yearly lecture that has allowed us to bring in some of the top legal minds in the country to the University of New Orleans. In attendance tonight from Adams and Reese are Joseph Looney, who I just mentioned, and Chuck Adams, the managing partner for the law firm. We thank them for their support. Finally, we also partner with a number of organizations that provided support both to us and to our students. This includes the UNO Philosophy Department, the UNO Student Government, the Charles Koch Foundation, and the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason University. For information about the opportunities available to the students from these organizations, you can find those on the back of the card that was handed to you when you came in. Now to our speaker. Tonight we welcome to UNO David Meyer, the Mitchell Franklin Professor of Law and Dean of the Tulane Law School. Dean Meyer's expertise relates to constitutional law and family law, and he has written extensively on topics at the intersection of these two fields. Before coming to Tulane, Meyer was on the faculty of the University of Illinois College of Law. Prior to entering academia, he served as a legal advisor at the Iran United States Claims Tribunal in The Hague and practiced law in Washington, D.C. and Chicago. He was a law clerk for Judge Harry T. Edwards on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit and for the U.S. Supreme Court for Justice Byron White. Meyer graduated with a BA in history with highest honors and a JD magna cum laude from the University of Michigan, where he also served as the editor-in-chief of the Law Review. Tonight, he will be speaking about recent developments in constitutional doctrine, expanding autonomy rights, and explore what role remains for the enforcement of majoritarian values through family law. Please join me in welcoming Dean David Meyer. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, for that introduction and, uh, and, of course, for the opportunity to be here. I'm really uh, very grateful to the Tocqueville Project for, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, it's really a, a great honor to, to be here and, uh, and humbling to follow the line of speakers I know have been uh, part of this uh, lecture series in the past. Uh, I also want to add my thanks uh, personally to Adams and Reese uh, as well for its uh, support of this lecture series. Uh, I know uh, personally, of course, uh, uh, how important that kind of support is to an academic community and uh, know what it means uh, to, uh, to, to facilitate events like this. So thank you so much for, uh, for your support. Uh, well, I wanted to focus this evening on the dramatic changes remaking family law. Uh, and, uh, and I want to submit to you out of the gates that I think that there is no field of law that has been more transformed uh, over the past uh, half century or so uh, than family law. Uh, one reason uh, for this transformation, I think there are two big reasons driving this transformation, uh, and one of those has to do with equality and changing notions of uh, what that means. Uh, traditional family law, of course, was uh, shot through with notions of uh, inequality uh, that have not always stood the test of time. Uh, if you think about the bedrock assumptions of the separate and distinctive capacities of men and women uh, and of parents, adults, and children uh, that were written into the very grain of family law. Uh, and you really don't have to go back uh, very far at all to recollect just how uh, profound these uh, uh, distinctions were written into family law. It was as <clears throat> recent as the 1970s, something that uh, uh, students uh, today are uh, aghast to appreciate, 
uh, that state statutes uh, across much of the United States commanded, as a matter of law, the subservience of wives to their husbands uh, as uh, what the statutes called the natural head of the family, uh, or in the parlance of Louisiana law, the head and master. Uh, today, such subordination uh, is so plainly out of line with prevailing norms uh, that it cannot be made legally effective even if the parties uh, freely agreed to it. Uh, so marital contracts uh, that have been written to uh, provide for the authority of husbands over their wives have been uh, in more recent times held legally unenforceable as against public policy. So evolving notions of equality uh, have pushed family law to embrace gender neutrality uh, across the board in custody law, alimony, property, uh, and so on. But the second uh, major driver of transformation in family law uh, ha has been a growing unease with state-enforced morality in private life more generally. Uh, traditional family law was also shot through uh, with moral judgments about the way uh, uh, intimate life should be lived. Uh, about the moral duties of husbands and wives uh, and parents and children. Uh, this was the heart of fault-based divorce uh, or inquiries into the moral fitness of parents in custody cases uh, or the basis for refusing legal recognition uh, of rights of cohabiting couples uh, and much, much more of the bread and butter of family law. Well, burgeoning notions of privacy rights in constitutional law uh, have, of course, recognized uh, many new limitations on the power of the state to enforce popular moral judgment uh, in intimate family life. Uh, that notion of autonomy uh, in what the Supreme Court has called on, uh, on many occasions in its decisions a private sphere of family life which the state cannot enter uh, has been expanded in recent uh, years from traditional marriage and parent-child relationships to new and unconventional uh, uh, forms of family life as well. For some, the retreat of moral judgment in family life has called into question uh, the very enterprise of family law uh, and raised doubts over whether it is any business of the state uh, to endorse or enforce majoritarian family values uh, or even the notion of who counts as a family. Uh, I want to take up that question this evening uh, and to consider how far uh, recent developments in constitutional law go in requiring moral neutrality uh, in, uh, with regard to the family. Uh, and I propose to do this uh, in part by recalling and reevaluating uh, the work uh, of another uh, scholar in family law, an important scholar, an influential scholar, uh, dating back uh, really several decades, uh, a man named Bruce Hafen, uh, who was at Brigham Young University. Uh, Professor Hafen was one of the founding uh, faculty members at BYU uh, Law School and went on to serve as its dean and uh, the university provost. Uh, and he remains a senior leader in the LDS Church. Uh, for our purposes, though, I want to focus on his work as a uh, as a law professor uh, back earlier in his career uh, and some of the landmark uh, work he wrote writing exactly at this uh, intersection. Writing 25 or 30 years ago, uh, Professor Hafen uh, was a cogent critic of trends in family life uh, and law uh, that posed what uh, he saw as a threat to traditional family values. Uh, perhaps the central theme of his critique uh, was that family law was surrendering the communal values that had long made families special uh, by exalting individual autonomy over social interests in family life. Uh, he saw this trend in changes uh, including the rise of no-fault divorce, marital contracting, uh, and children's rights uh, that pushed family law from a foundation in status uh, to contract, from a model of thick, or what he called thick familistic obligation uh, to thin contractual undertakings. And he saw in it also in, in the creeping encroachment of constitutional oversight springing from the egalitarian individual rights imperatives of the civil rights revolution of the 1950s and 60s, 
Uh, he saw in those cases that presumed a heavy privilege for individual autonomy uh, and discounted social interests and traditions in defining the family a threat to these uh, traditional values. He was careful to acknowledge uh, all along that these trends were not altogether bad. Uh, he welcomed inroads on tradition that improved the status of women uh, or that uh, eliminated uh, distinctions based on race uh, and, uh, and that uh, guarded against uh, family violence. Those were all good. Uh, but he saw a, a risk in developments that might unravel traditional prescriptions of family law uh, and with it uh, the family itself. Uh, over the past 25 years, he wrote in 1991 in the BYU Law Review, uh, much of law's scholarly literature and a good deal of case law have proceeded on the assumption that the Constitution, especially the recent doctrine of autonomous privacy, should inaugurate a new era liberated from the constraints of normative values in order to protect each person's right to do things that touch the heart of the existing order, quoting an earlier case. Under this view, he wrote in the same article, personal autonomy is such a central constitutional value that no majoritarian policy or process should be allowed to limit the choices of individuals unless those choices cause serious and demonstrable harm to others. Uh, in the race to vindicate the freedom of each individual to chart his own course in intimate life, unfettered by enforceable moral judgments or social preferences, Professor Hafen foresaw what he called a waning of belonging, in which the family would lose its power both to bind and ultimately to elevate individuals within its orbit uh, to the great impoverishment he feared of future generations. Uh, at the time Professor Hafen uh, sounded these warnings 25 to 30 years ago, the developments that he surveyed in constitutional law uh, were fresh. Uh, and the outcome was uh, far from certain. Uh, when he wrote a classic uh, article in the Michigan Law Review uh, in uh, 1983, the full-throated uh, revival of substantive due process uh, in the family cases, uh, most particularly in Roe versus Wade, uh, was not yet 10 years old. Uh, and the idea of same-sex marriage, as he noted then uh, at the time, was all but unimaginable. Uh, the constitutional and legal developments uh, in the 25 years since then uh, would appear to confirm many of the trends that Professor Hafen had lamented. Major Supreme Court decisions from Planned Parenthood versus Casey uh, dealing with abortion uh, to Lawrence versus Texas dealing with uh, sodomy laws uh, to last year's decision in United States versus Windsor uh, dealing with uh, legal recognition of same-sex marriage in federal law, uh, have embraced bold pronouncements privileging individual autonomy and discounting social interests in limiting choice. Uh, in my remaining time, I want to revisit uh, his commentary uh, in foreseeing uh, these developments uh, correctly. Uh, but to reconsider uh, what their implications might be uh, and uh, in evaluating today's state of affairs. Uh, although many of the recent developments uh, might well seem to have overrun Professor Hafen's vision for a family law tied, uh, in his view, to venerable family forms like marriage uh, and to venerable norms like permanence and self-sacrifice, uh, I believe there is actually much in his analysis that remains fresh and fitted to today's doctrine uh, as much as it was then. Specifically, uh, contrary to the fears that the age of autonomy, as it's sometimes uh, styled, uh, would leave no room for public preferences and values in the construction of family life, uh, there remains an imperative today to weigh private choices against public moral judgment even under constitutional doctrine as it has emerged in the past quarter century. So let me begin by very briefly reviewing uh, the key points in Professor Hafen's vision uh, for what he thought was the appropriate constitutional role in family law. Uh, importantly, as a starting point, he accepted that it was legitimate, uh, notwithstanding the lack of any explicit constitutional text, uh, for courts to understand the Constitution to provide special protection to family. Uh, 
he, uh, yet he also uh, saw potentially grave danger in allowing courts to run roughshod over traditional family law in the name of individual rights. He saw that customary individual rights analysis borrowed from other contexts, uh, say the uh, rights of the criminally accused or uh, apropos of yesterday, the right to vote, uh, was often ill-suited to the family law environment. Uh, that analysis, that traditional analysis, of course presumes uh, that individual rights deemed to be fundamental uh, in the constitutional sense are uh, presumptively uh, inviolate uh, unless the state can somehow show uh, some extraordinary justification uh, for intruding. Uh, that balance, uh, imbalance in favor of individual rights uh, which expressed in legal doctrine in the uh, what's called the strict scrutiny formula uh, was uh, uh, insists upon proof by the government of compelling interests and narrowly tailored means uh, and the famous quip about that standard that strict scrutiny is strict in theory uh, but fatal in fact uh, is a slight overstatement but it captures the basic idea which is mostly true that where that standard applies a government action will fail uh, and the individual interest will go uh, unregulated by the government. Uh, well, this sort of grievous imbalance in favor of the individual's uh, liberty uh, might well be suited to the case of a criminal defendant facing down uh, the awesome power of the state, uh, but it fits notice notably worse uh, in the context of intra-family disputes uh, where multiple parties can have their own uh, conflicting rights and interests within the family. In that setting, vindicating one family member's uh, fundamental interests uh, may well curtail the uh, equally fundamental interests of other family members uh, with respect to those same relationships. Imagine, for instance, two parents competing over custody of a child, uh, each having uh, quite arguably a compelling uh, and fundamental interest in that relationship. Well, this, led, uh, this realization led Professor Hafen to be skeptical of the utility of a broader constitutionalization of family law. Uh, given that the resolution of family conflicts requires a uh, highly fact-sensitive case-by-case uh, inquiry uh, into the circumstances of each family, uh, he thought that adding the high octane of constitutional law was likely to do little to improve the court's inevitable interest balancing. Uh, beyond being unhelpful, though, uh, he also feared that an excessive intrusion of constitutional scrutiny into family law uh, threatened outright harm. The civil rights way of thinking a refocused judicial inquiry on the fulfillment of claimants' individualistic entitlements uh, in their family interactions, rather than on the ways in which family status traditionally has melted individual interests into communal obligation to others within the family. Uh, the heavy weight assigned to fundamental rights under strict scrutiny left little room to credit important social interests in family life. Uh, given the family's role as an important mediating institution between individuals and the state, Professor Hafen believed that individual and social interests in the family should be weighed on the same plane, he wrote. Uh, well, convinced that this was impossible uh, within the framework, once a court finds family interest to be a fundamental right and applies strict scrutiny, Professor Hafen focused his energies on the threshold determination of whether a claimed intimate interest qualified for heightened uh, protection. His proposed methodology weighed not the importance of the interest to the individual claimant or its functional equivalence to rights protected in past cases, but instead on whether extending protection to the claimed asserted interest uh, was uh, uh, served social interests in the aggregate, only in finding that it would serve social interests in protecting an individual's interest did that individual interest then warrant this uh, heightened constitutional protection. Uh, uh, Professor Hafen made the case that this methodology could be said to fit the 50 or so uh, mostly unruly uh, family-related Supreme Court precedents decided at the time he wrote in 1983, and by weighing tradition and formal family status, 
the, method the methodology he thought was capable of holding the line of heightened constitutional protection where it then stood uh, to claimants protected by formal ties of blood, marriage, or adoption. Holding that line was important, Professor Hafen argued, because a more generalized autonomy right requiring the state to justify any intrusion on private intimate choices with proof that the conduct is demonstrably harmful uh, would mean that, uh, quoting Professor Hafen, laws discriminating between married and unmarried persons or laws restric restricting the sexual privacy of adults could become unconstitutional mm -hmm. simply because compelling evidence that moral permissiveness is either beneficial or harmful is so difficult to adduce. Well, Professor Hafen wrote at a juncture when, for 25 years, uh, law had edged towards the triumph of autonomy, but the future was not yet uh, certain. But the 25 years since he wrote have made clear that we have uh, clearly crossed the Rubicon uh, in embracing a capacious notion of personal autonomy in intimate and family life. The markers that Professor Hafen looked to uh, to constrain the expansion of privacy rights, tradition, and social interests have not prevailed in the years since as the exclusive or even uh, necessarily the dominant determinants of fundamental uh, intimate rights. Dissenting in Bowers versus Hardwick in 1986, the case that narrowly turned back a constitutional attack on a Georgia law criminalizing sodomy, Justice Blackman seemed to take direct aim at the constitutional methodology endorsed by Professor Hafen. Uh, quoting Justice Blackman, we protect these rights of intimacy and self-definition not because they contribute to the general welfare, uh, but because they form so central a part of an individual's life. That seemed to be speaking almost in direct contradiction of Professor Hafen's uh, thesis. In 2003, in Lawrence versus Texas, the court overturned Bowers and expressly embraced the reasoning of Justice Blackmun's dissent. In striking down Texas's criminal ban on same-sex intimacy, the court emphasized uh, the essential equivalence between the interest at stake for same-sex partners and those joined in traditional marriage. To say that the, quoting the court, to say that the issue was simply the right to engage in certain sexual conduct the court wrote, demeans the claim the individual put forward just as it would demean a married couple were it to be said that marriage is simply about the right to have sexual intercourse. Lawrence protected sexual intimacy on the ground that, quote, the conduct can be but one element in a personal bond that is more enduring, and that this was a personal relationship, whether or not entitled to formal recognition in the law, uh, that is within the liberty of persons to choose without being punished as criminals. The court then took a step farther, uh, adding, quote, this as a general rule should counsel against attempts by the state or a court to define the meaning of the relationship or to set its boundaries absent injury to a person or abuse of an institution the law protects. With this implying a duty of state neutrality concerning intimate life, absent demonstrable harm, uh, Lawrence came perilously close to fulfilling Professor Hafen's wary prediction that once the outer walls fell, the entire edifice of traditional family law might come tumbling down. Although Lawrence itself stopped short of requiring affirmative public uh, validation of the private relationships it protected, it did not take long for other courts uh, to carry its logic forward. Uh, Massachusetts, as many will know, was the first in just a matter of months uh, to extend uh, the logic of Lawrence to require state recognition uh, of same-sex marriages. Uh, like Lawrence, it did not struggle uh, long over the threshold classification uh, of the right as uh, either fundamental or not. It bypassed strict scrutiny uh, and instead held simply that the state's incursion on liberty, as it put it, also autonomy, uh, required it to demonstrate strong reasons, uh, required Massachusetts, that is, to demonstrate strong reasons for its limitation on marriage, which the court found it failed to do. Uh, in 2013, uh, a decade after the Massachusetts ruling, 
uh, the U.S. Supreme Court took a very similar tack in United States versus Windsor, striking down the portion of the Defense of Marriage Act that had denied recognition under federal law for same-sex marriages, blending together due process and equal protection principles, the court ruled that Congress's mobilization to specially deny federal marriage recognition to same-sex couples revealed an impermissible, quote, purpose and effect to disparage and to injure those whom a state by its marriage laws sought to protect. The differentiation, the court wrote, demeans the couple whose moral and sexual choices the Constitution protects, citing Lawrence, uh, and whose relationship the, st the state has sought to dignify. Uh, although Windsor insisted, uh, like Lawrence before it, that it was not suggesting a constitutional duty on states in the first instance to allow same-sex marriage, it did not take long, as Justice Scalia had predicted in dissent, uh, for lower courts to see the writing on the wall. Uh, in the scant 17 months since Windsor was decided, a deluge of decisions uh, uh, in lower federal courts uh, from Alaska to North Carolina uh, has invoked Windsor's logic to strike down laws banning same-sex marriage. Uh, the more, most recent decisions, uh, the most recent of these decisions came just yesterday uh, in an order in federal district court uh, uh, ordering uh, Kansas to become the 33rd state uh, in the United States to allow same-sex marriages. Uh, to date, uh, as uh, uh, m many here may know, only two federal district courts uh, have defied this trend. Uh, one, a member of your advisory board, uh, uh, Judge Martin Feldman uh, here in New Orleans, uh, ruled in September upholding Louisiana's law. Uh, and uh, two weeks ago, uh, a federal district court in Puerto Rico filed, uh, followed suit. Yet the great weight of authority uh, has emphasized Windsor's importance in concluding uh, quoting one representative decision, that the Constitution's protection of the individual rights of gay and lesbian citizens is equally dispositive whether this protection requires a court to respect a state law, as in Windsor, uh, or strike down a state law, uh, as in these decisions. Uh, last December, by the way, a federal trial uh, court in Utah similarly invoked uh, Win or Lawrence's protection. Uh, this was before uh, Windsor, but invoked Lawrence's protection of highly personalized relationships to strike down a portion of Utah's law criminalizing plural marriage. In a case involving uh, a, the polygamous family featured on the cable show uh, Sister Wives, uh, the court could find no demonstrable harm to justify criminalizing a man uh, from uh, privately or even on television uh, purporting to marry more than one wife at a time at least so long as there is no duplicative claim on formal public recognition or public benefits. Uh, although the court in the sister wives case, like the Supreme Court in Lawrence, required only decriminalization and not public recognition, uh, it is not hard to imagine another shoe yet to drop. Certainly, Cody Brown, the protagonist's uh, counsel, uh, law professor Jonathan Turley, uh, now at George Washington Law School, but who began his career at Tulane Law School, uh, at the very beginning, uh, uh, saw the case, saw in the case a far broader principle. Uh, the case he wrote in an op-ed following the decision, quote, was about the right of consenting adults to make decisions for themselves and their families and establishing that governments cannot impose a single version of morality. The era of morality codes, he crowed, citing laws uh, defining traditional marriage or curbing unmarried cohabitation, is coming to an inglorious end. Well, uh, all of this might seem to confirm Professor Hafen's warnings a quarter century ago uh, about what an expansive age of autonomy might mean uh, for family law. Uh, I want to suggest, however, that even under the constitutional doctrine that has carried the day uh, in the past 25 years, there is room to heed uh, his core arguments about the importance of crediting uh, social interests in family life and of articulating family values that reflect high expectations about the moral content of family relationships. Uh, while many recent developments in the courts have not favored the methodology advanced by Professor Hafen, uh, the import of tradition, for example, as a determinant of constitutional protection has been much diminished. 
some important developments have opened up space uh, to credit social interests in the family by other means. Uh, even if recent case law has moved beyond the doctrinal limits that Professor Him Hafen himself uh, had suggested, core themes in his scholarship remain useful uh, in uh, allowing family values and social interests to be credited uh, uh, and balanced against the claims of individuals. Uh, so let me identify a couple of those uh, briefly. One of the most striking uh, of the constitutional developments relating to family privacy uh, in recent decades uh, has been the movement qualifying the strength of protection uh, given by the courts to family interests. Uh, recall that Professor Hafen's primary rationale uh, for seeking to balance social interests uh, in the initial determination of whether a family interest qualified as fundamental and therefore qualified for uh, higher constitutional protection was the assumption that if you crossed that threshold and strict scrutiny then applied to protect the right, uh, the state would have no you know, realistic basis for uh, proceeding with regulation. Uh, yet in a wide uh, range of decisions uh, spanning family-related interests from abortion to parenting rights to same-sex intimacy uh, and more, the Supreme Court has gone to pains in recent years to sidestep uh, the, this traditional strict scrutiny uh, formula. As clearly as any, the abortion cases illustrate the hesitation. In substituting a much more indeterminate doctrinal test, known as the undue burden test, uh, for the strict scrutiny test of traditional constitutional doctrine, uh, the court noted in the abortion cases that unlike the usual individual versus state scenarios, the woman's asserted interest in controlling her pregnancy potentially collided with the substantial interests of other family members, including the potential father uh, and child, uh, and that this required more leeway for state regulation to mediate the conflicting uh, private interests. The justices appeared to reach much the same conclusion uh, in the context of a family fight over child visitation. Uh, in 2000, in a case called Troxel versus Granville, a plurality of justices found constitutional limits on state laws granting visitation rights to grandparents. Uh, the justices readily found that court-ordered visitation in fact burdened the fundamental constitutional rights of parents to raise their children as they see fit. Uh, yet, instead of then applying the traditional strict scrutiny formula, uh, as the lower courts had done uh, before the case reached the Supreme Court, the plurality would say only that a court considering visitation must give what the court helpfully called special weight to the parents' objections uh, uh, before overriding them, uh, but did no more to define how much that weight counted for. Uh, again, the reason for diluting the strength of protection uh, appeared evident in a reading of the courts or the pluralities, uh, the various opinions of the justices, uh, which was that uh, the court feared heavily privileging one family member's entitlement from recognition that it would necessarily uh, intrude upon the interests of other family members uh, that were perhaps equally deserving uh, of recognition. The court's avoidance of strict scrutiny finally in Lawrence and in Windsor in each case seeming to find fundamental intimacy inter interests before resolving them on the basis of a murky, ramped up, uh, rational basis kind of review uh, followed the same suit. Uh, the court's willingness to bend doctrine in this way is itself vindication of Professor Hafen's core insight that traditional individual rights analysis is ill-fitted to most family privacy cases. Acceptance of that insight has led the court not to raise the bar for what counts as a protected family interest, that would have been Professor Hafen's suggestion, but instead to soften the bias against government regulation of family once protected interests are found. Nevertheless, uh, it does leave room for uh, courts to credit more fully social interests in family life uh, than would be possible under uh, strict scrutiny. Well, while the court's recent cases have expanded 
uh, the scope of interests qualifying for heightened constitutional protection, they have not gone so far as to say that any sincerely held individual conception of intimate life is entitled to this sort of constitutional protection. To the contrary, uh, while extending protection beyond families formally uh, defined by blood, marriage, and adoption, uh, taking a more expansive view of the family protected by the Constitution, uh, the court has uh, nevertheless uh, uh, rested its judgments about, uh, in part, in, at least implicitly, on core values that define family. Recall, for instance, that Lawrence, in striking down Texas's sodomy law, justified special constitutional protection not because the claimant asserted a sincerely held interest in transitory sexual gratification, but because the court saw the conduct at issue as part of a durable, intimate relationship capable of sharing in the essential qualities of traditional marriage. Lower federal courts have relied on the same finding in striking uh, laws banning same-sex marriage after Windsor. Quote, the inner attributes of marriage that form the core justifications for why the Constitution protects this fundamental right, uh, wrote one federal judge in Utah, are as applicable to same-sex couples as they are to opposite-sex couples. Uh, it's, of course, possible to disagree with the conclusions, but the point is that the current constitutional doctrine continues to require some finding of conformity with core public family values before extending constitutional protection. Lawrence, uh, after all, did not extinguish any role for traditional and public consensus in defining the boundaries of the family protected within constitutional liberty. It held only that the traditions of the past 50 years are more relevant uh, and that a contemporary, or even as it put it, an emerging social consensus might suffice to trigger protection uh, in the absence of support in more deeply rooted uh, traditions. Uh, this, of course, would come as cold comfort to Professor Hafen and others who worried uh, about the slipperiness of such judgments in the hands of unelected judges. Uh, but it does at least leave room for public preferences about family and the public articulation of core family values. It makes possible, for example, uh, in the inevitable follow-on case that will come shortly, asserting a right to state recognition of polygamous marriages, not just private relationships, but formally recognized polygamous marriages, it allows a spirited debate over whether exclusive pair-bonded commitment is an essential component of the sort of family valued by society uh, and by the Constitution. Uh, in surveying these recent developments, Yale law professor uh, William Eskridge, uh, himself a prominent advocate of same-sex marriage and much of the movement towards greater uh, accommodation in family law, distanced himself from those who would celebrate total libertarianism in family law. Uh, the import of recent changes, he contended, uh, was not a duty of absolute state neutrality toward different conceptions of family life, but greater care in articulating its preferences and a softer hand in enforcing them. By his account, constitutional doctrine and changing social norms have substituted more uh, what he called more gentle nudges in family law for hard shoves in channeling individuals toward socially preferred forms of intimate life, but they have not uh, dispensed with public preferences altogether. Uh, the sliding scale approach to constitutional protection uh, that has emerged in recent cases may then forbid uh, criminalization of an intimate practice, the ultimate sort of hard shove, uh, while stopping short of requiring equal public validation through marriage uh, or otherwise. Well, in the past 25 years since uh, Hafen's writing, new evidence continues to mount uh, showing why society cannot be limited to neutrality among the widening array of private intimate arrangements. Uh, one body of empirical literature shows that uh, marriage appears to offer substantial benefits as compared to alternative partnership arrangements, both for the intimates themselves uh, and for society. Studies comparing cohabitants with married partners and controlling for other variables uh, 
show that cohabiting relationships are, generally speaking, shorter, poorer, and more susceptible to divorce if the couple later marries. Some studies also suggest that the disparities extend beyond material well-being and include uh, differences in the quality and intensity of intimate bonding, both between the adult partners uh, and even with their children. Controlling for other factors, such as education, income, and length of relationship, researchers found that cohabitants reported themselves uh, lower relationship quality and more qualified commitment than did their married counterparts. Some have found similar disparities in the quality of parent-child relationships in married as opposed to cohabiting uh, households. One study, for example, uh, found, uh, quoting here Illinois uh, law professor Robin Wilson, that, quote, the biological child of cohabitants consistently received smaller investments from their fathers than a biological child of married parents in both blended and non-blended households. These outcomes comport, of course, with Professor Hafen's observation that durable, unqualified, and ultimately even selfless commitment to the welfare of others is essential to understanding the unique social and individual power of family. The observed uh, marriage advantage, as it's been called, uh, plays into a related but uh, distinct social concern as well. Uh, the marriage gap, the so-called marriage gap, and the role that different family living patterns play in aggravating social and economic inequality. The rise of assortative marriage in which individuals with similar economic prospects uh, uh, pair off, or are likely to pair off with one another, uh, would aggravate economic inequalities even if all were equally likely to marry. Uh, but in fact, marriage is more common and more durable among those with more education and resources and in retreat, uh, sharp retreat, among those who might benefit most from a stable economic partnership. The result, as Minnesota law professor June Carbone has observed, is the emergence of, quote, a class continuum that includes a privileged middle class that continues to embrace somewhat traditional marital norms an increasingly separate working class cycling in and out of serial marriage, and an underclass for whom marriage has effectively disappeared. And given the common uh, economic benefits associated with stable marriage, this pattern has compounded the divergent economic prospects of the well-off and the struggling. At a time when uh, the President of the United States has pledged to make reducing income inequality a central goal of his second term, society cannot afford to be indifferent to the role that private choices uh, uh, play uh, relating to marriage, cohabitation, and divorce uh, in that growing uh, economic uh, and social inequality. Now, in closing, I do not mean to suggest that we go back to recognizing only marriage and formal kinship in family law or constitutional doctrine. I see no going back, uh, even if we were inclined to go back. Uh, given the dramatic shifts in living patterns uh, in recent decades. But neither must courts or legislatures be neutral with regard to alter alternative intimate choices. Professor Hafen was right in 1983 that society has strong interests in the family choices made by private individuals and that those social interests must be given serious consideration in any constitutional review of family law. Doctrinal developments in recent years have made constitutional protection for family interests more diffuse uh, and less determinate, uh, but they have not made it boundless. Uh, the court's task today is to align the scope of constitutional protection with society's understanding of the core values that define family, and then to weigh social interests against the individuals in determining the range of permissible regulation. This may be difficult and prone to error, uh, but there may be no better alternative. To quote Professor Hafen in defending the court's role in constitutional adjudication, the court's primary business, after all, is making different, difficult choices between conflicting values. Uh, and so it remains today. Uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity, and I'm happy to invite uh, your questions or comments.
So we have some time for questions. Uh, if you could use the microphone, uh, it won't actually amplify your voice, as you can hear, but it goes back to the, back to the control room. So I've got some questions there, and then um, once you're, let's see if I find a convenient way to do this. Uh, we'll just go this way. You can just hand it back to me as soon as you're <laughs> okay, so based on the studies that you were talking about, what I'm part of my takeaway is that there is a value in marriage, regardless of to society, regardless of the sexual orientation or the the, the leanings of the in the intimate parties involved. But it is to society's benefit to structure itself in a way that would would uphold the con the institution of marriage. Is that the takeaway from the studies yeah, at, at well, the, the end? The studies themselves didn't actually involve um, married same-sex couples because at the time they were done, that wasn't uh, an option available. So, that, so there, the studies were done of uh, married opposite-sex couples versus opposite-sex unmarried cohabitants. Uh, and uh, so the question would be whether you could extrapolate from that to project. So it made no claim about... Uh, about the gender of the, the couples, but it did uh, find, uh, there were several uh, studies that, uh, that uh, reached the conclusion that couples who were married, when you tried to control and look for the, you know, had been living together for 20 years, uh, you know, and had the same income and same education and same religious identification and all the other variables that you might control for, but then the one difference is one 20 year couple was married, one 20 year couple was cohabiting. Uh, that found uh, differences in terms of uh, relationship quality and, uh, and so on. Uh, I have a question about uh, where you see plural marriage maybe going in the future. Uh, and I ask because, um, you know, this is the, the boogeyman under the bed that the uh, opponents of same-sex marriage always bring out. Uh, but plural marriage, as we've had it in the U.S. in the past, has been very much based in the ancient asymmetrical relationship between men and women. A man had multiple wives who were sisters to each other, and some of the, the, the one celebrity case you mentioned is really an attempt to replicate that, but in the modern egalitarian system, uh, a plural marriage seems to me to imply that all the parties involved are spouses to each other, which would be a legal nightmare to sort out under any circumstances. What kinds of plural marriage do you think maybe could exist, and how do you s balance that uh, counter egalitarian tradition with the, the egalitarian, yeah. egalitarian trend? You know, it's a it's a great question, and uh, and I do think it's a fascinating, uh, you know, what will come in the cases. And there have been uh, several besides the case I mentioned. There have been a number of cases uh, in recent years, both in the United States and Canada, and some other. Uh, uh, legal systems that have challenged the constitutionality of laws banning same-sex or plural marriage. Uh, and, uh, and the arguments that courts have relied on uh, in upholding uh, the bans on plural marriage uh, have looked to evidence of uh, social harms uh, connected with those, including uh, you know, the uh, exploitation of women or children abuse within relationships and sort of uh, you know, various things relating to the you know, inequality within the relationship, as you point out. Uh, the thing that uh, strikes me as interesting is, of course, there are parallels within traditional uh, two-party marriage as well, going back in time. That, it, it, in, you know, As I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, you don't have to go back so far in history uh, to find that as a matter of formal law uh, and custom as well, uh, that uh, traditional marriage was heavily gendered and, uh, you know, carried, uh, you know, unequal roles uh, for the parties. Uh, and, uh, and yet we have gotten beyond that in two-party marriage uh, to evaluate the benefits of marriage free from the trappings, the historical trappings of the, you know, uh, what are fairly demonstrable social ills attached to that model. The question is whether we can get there with, with plural marriage as well, as you point out that there are uh, you know, there are some uh, marriages that don't quite fit that mold. Uh, but, I mean, I do think, for me, and I, I don't purport to have uh, uh, the expertise of a social scientist to speak authoritatively to the, to the factual questions, mm -hmm. but it does raise, I, I think, a deeply interesting empirical question about what is it about marriage 
that seems by these studies uh, to be so beneficial for not just for society, society benefits from the greater productivity and stability and so on of these unions, but also uh, for the individuals themselves who report that they feel uh, you know, happier in their relationships and their lives uh, than, uh, uh, than otherwise. What is it about that relationship that has that sort of, you know, perhaps to overstate the case a little bit, the sort of this magic quality that makes people uh, uh, do better in that way? Uh, and is it, and this is the question with relation to the debate over same-sex marriage as well, what is it, and would a same-sex uh, union share all the essential qualities and so therefore be uh, equally valuable? Uh, or is there something about gender that matters to that? Well, likewise, with plural marriage, is there something about the, the pair bond that is uh, essential uh, to that quality? Uh, or could it be replicated with a multi-party uh, marriage? I don't claim to have the answer to that question, but that's the sort of thing that I think we would uh, need to struggle with in answering not only the, the short answer would have been from Professor Hafen that, well, that's just not a marriage that we traditionally have recognized. Therefore, it's not entitled to constitutional protection because it has no traditional pedigree uh, of respect. Uh, and now, with the trend of decisions, I think we're pushed to uh, think harder about not just whether historically this is a differently situated sort of union, but in terms of its uh, uh, qualities, uh, it is also differently situated. I just think of a very practical problem. Oh, sorry. Let me just, so that you can... yeah. sorry, I just think of a very practical, not very theoretical, just completely applied situation. There's three people that are co-spouses. One's in the hospital, and you decide you're deciding whether to pull the plug, and the two other spouses disagree. You know. Uh, we have systems in place for that sort of thing in our in the two-party marriage, but in a yes. three-party marriage, how do you resolve something like that? Yeah. It, would, it would undoubtedly require some uh, innovation uh, to to uh, to deal with that. I will say uh, this is not to you know advocate in favor of plural marriage. Don't uh, misconstrue, but the uh, uh, but but I would observe that you know we we deal with contentious, difficult problems elsewhere in family law. The joint custody arrangements uh, present the risk that you'll have an impasse uh, that will require a messy uh, resolution, and and so, uh, so this is not sort of unique to this uh, situation. But you're right; it would present some thorny problems. You mentioned that uh, the field of family law is the most transformed within the last 50 years. And I'm wondering then, for those judges that are in that field, are they well prepared to be able to manage this transformation, which is happening even as they make judgments? Uh, well, it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's a hard question because there's, uh, there's, family law itself that's evolving and constitutional law that's also evolving. And of course, uh, the I mean, I do believe uh, judges are, are qualified to keep up, but it's, it is a, I mean, I was, I was struck by, to return to this case of Troxel versus Granville, which was the case I mentioned uh, that concerned uh, grandparent visitation. Uh, and for me, that, that is a telling case about the challenges and the complexity here. It's a case that, uh, to briefly explain, was uh, uh, I think when the Supreme Court granted certiorari and agreed to review the case, uh, I'm convinced that the Supreme Court thought this was going to be a no-brainer case that it could knock out in an afternoon uh, and be done with it because it was a case involving a statute in the state of Washington uh, that said, and here this is a nearly verbatim quote, the statute said, a court is empowered to grant visitation with a child uh, for the benefit of a grandparent, or no, for any person, I'm sorry, I didn't say for a grandparent, said for any person at any time uh, that the court finds it would be in the best interest of the child, period. So it, on its face, gave the courts the authority to grant child visitation to the bag boy at the grocery store uh, if the court thought that that would seem a, like a nice thing for the child. Uh, well, the court agreed to review that case, uh, and I'm certain thought 
that this statute has got to go. It's obviously wildly uh, out of line with the fundamental right of parents uh, to raise their children. What happened uh, was that then the court was faced with a mountain of amicus briefs, front of the court briefs that were submitted uh, by parties ranging from AARP to uh, foster care uh, advocacy groups to uh, same-sex, uh, you know, gay and lesbian uh, family groups. Uh, and the court began to appreciate suddenly that what seemed like this, uh, you know, crazy case to suggest that a non-parent could get visitation at any time a judge thought it would be beneficial. Uh, and the court began to appreciate the enormous complexity with family life today, that there are so many ways in which families are organized that don't fit the traditional model of parents raising their children in the nuclear family with some external grandparent coming in seeking visitation. Uh, and what resulted was that the court, there was no majority opinion in the, in the case. Instead, there were, I think, seven different opinions uh, by the judges or the justices in uh, that case, and they splendid all mm -hmm. over the map. Uh, they mostly agreed that the court should be much more careful, give special weight, uh, before overriding a parent's judgment. Uh, but that's the, pretty much the most they could agree to. Uh, and for me, that reflected both the, the justices' sort of education in the complexity of family law today as a topic they don't ordinarily see, uh, since it's a state law topic and not usually the stuff of the US Supreme Court. Uh, but they quickly appreciated that uh, the field has gotten a great deal more complex than they probably recalled from, you know, their experience 40 years previously. Uh, and it caused them to be much more cautious in, uh, in intervening. So to return to your question about are judges equipped and prepared to, to weigh into these questions, well, uh, we're all struggling with it. All of us are struggling to uh, keep up and understand and uh, uh, understand the changes that are unfolding in the society around us. Um, it's almost ironic that the 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 value of the family for uh, those at the uh, the lowest uh, level of the socioeconomic uh, power structure would be uh, abdicating that strength uh, almost unknowingly by uh, allowing for this uh, expansion of autonomy. Uh, through the courts sidestepping uh, uh, strict scrutiny. Um, I guess my question is, is this stripping and diluting of uh, meaning deleterious to the power of traditional definitions? Uh, let me make sure I understand your question. So is, is the, uh, the move towards autonomy, uh, does it undermine tradition? Uh, and the meaning, uh, I should say the definition, uh, the definition of, uh, family or the, um, uh, let's see, how do I say it, by, um, by diluting the definition, like if, if, a, if a definition isn't strictly confined to um, a strict, uh, I guess you'd say, definition, um, is there any end to it? And one might say that if uh, um, definitions by, the, by their very nature are the uh, crux of a uh, um, forms of strength. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I, yeah, I'm being I, very. I, I understand. And and I, yes, I think I think you're right. That I mean that was uh, the core concern, uh, as I understand it, of Professor Hafen, among many others, was the notion that uh, if you are very generous in the way you define family at the outset of who counts as a family, what uh, is a family interest, and you. Uh, you sort of say, you know, at the extreme end, whatever you say, whatever you regard as a family in your life, we will respect and, and treat as a family, and you're therefore entitled to heightened constitutional protection for whatever way you want to live your, your intimate life. Uh, taken to that extreme, uh, then everything becomes family, potentially, as long as it's a sincerely held belief of the individual. Uh, and then the government is uh, severely disabled from being able to regulate anything. Uh, and it becomes sort of, uh, you, know, a, you know, just a uh, free-for-all, basically, of, uh, of uh, private life. 
Uh, and so I do think that if you are extremely generous in the definition of what counts as family, uh, and uh, then that holds the danger, uh, that then effectively nothing gets specially protected because everything is equally <coughs> protected. Uh, and uh, so that's the risk. Uh, and, and Professor Hafen's solution to that was that we should be much more uh, uh, assertive in policing that definition of family uh, out of the gates uh, and keep family strictly to the question of would recognizing this interest be socially beneficial uh, in the aggregate, in which case if it fits with tradition, then we'll protect it uh, and keep the state out of that relationship. But otherwise, if it's a new relationship that doesn't fit that traditional boundary, then it's subject to free regulation by the state. So that was his answer for trying to maintain the strength of constitutional protection. Uh, where I think the court has gone in subsequent cases is to be, in fact, more generous at the definitional stage at the beginning, to recognize more and additional family uh, relationships as entitled to protection, uh, but, but has not gone so far as to say anything goes. Uh, because it continues in each of these cases uh, effectively to say, uh, is the asserted family interest that's before us today, is it in its core qualities like these relationships that we have protected in the past, especially as fundamental rights? If so, then it's entitled to protection. So there is still today, uh, although the court's not always uh, explicit about this, uh, there is still uh, an, uh, a requirement uh, that the court express some sort of public values about past judgment on the private relationship before it to decide whether it warrants, whether it merits uh, this higher con constitutional protection. I think the court doesn't like to own up to that uh, by acknowledging that it's doing that. It's the same way when I teach family law, and we just did this last week at my class uh, at Tulane, uh, and talking about the best interest of the child standard. Uh, and Courts commonly uh, want to disclaim, and students often want to disclaim that they're not passing any judgments on parents, that that's not their business to make value judgments about what, how parents want to raise their kids. But it is inescapable in the process of deciding the best of the child that you will be making value judgments about what you think is best for children uh, in the process. Well, I think here, too, in deciding what is family, what is constitutionally protected family, even more generously defined than traditional. Uh, courts can't avoid the necessity, and in fact, I think, in my own view, it's a good thing uh, that courts uh, uh, do make a decision out of the gates about whether this sort of family uh, is, uh, uh, shares in the qualities that warrant this uh, heightened uh, public deference. Professor Meyer, I, uh, I can't resist asking you whether or not you happen to know off the top of your head the penalty for bigamy in the state of Louisiana. I have not had occasion two to wives. test that law. You get two wives. That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> That'll teach you. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if... Um, <laughs> One is the ideal arrangement, I find. <laughs> um, I'm wondering, uh, apropos to this last question that you just asked, um, one of the first things, one of the first activities, one of the most amazing things that human beings do is we give names to things. And this is one of Adam's first activities. He names the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air and so forth. Uh, and that calls to mind... Abraham Lincoln's aphorism, how many tails does a dog have if you call a leg a tail? And the answer is not five, because calling a tail a leg does not make it a leg. So I'm curious if, in fact, language devolves in the sense that we're talking about, and if students and law, uh, lawyers and judges are trying to avoid passing a judgment, or how close are we, how, how much danger are we in of arriving at this point where we have judges who no longer pass judgments? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a big question. 
Uh, and, uh, and I think the best I can do to try to answer it is, uh, is just to observe that, that I certainly see it uh, all the time in court decisions uh, in which, uh, particularly in the family context, and this is, I think, a much more modern uh, thing, that it used to be uh, courts had no uh, self-consciousness whatsoever about passing judgment on families. That was what you, of course, were supposed to do in family law cases, uh, was to pass judgment on, on uh, divorcing spouses or parents or, uh, but nowadays it is gotten uh, sort of, to my mind, you know, sort of a, a, a strange, uh, you know, insistence that we're not passing any judgments whatsoever. Uh, it's not up to us to decide how people should live their lives. And, uh, and students are, are often, you know, very committed to this principle uh, that, uh, that it's entirely inappropriate for the state to be making judgments. But then, if you have a child whose custody has to be resolved, uh, and there is, uh, uh, you know, there's no better way to do it than to, uh, than to uh, make some predictive judgment about the child's welfare, which will, has to be. So, so I think that uh, we are in a, we've moved to a position where oftentimes uh, what, and I think you see it in some of these uh, U.S. Supreme Court decisions that, that I've just been discussing. Uh, in, uh, in which uh, courts are sometimes, uh, you know, reluctant to, uh, to own up to the fact that they are, in fact, uh, you know, expressing a public uh, preference about uh, some family forms over others. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I do think that that goes on. Mm -hmm. Just time for a couple more questions, one or two. <coughs> sure. Uh, I, I've had something of an epiphany this evening, thank you for that, uh, which is that I'm really very much in the, the view of, the, the modern view of marriage, which kind of sees, well, family and uh, relationships are things that change in society and, you know, aren't legally important, but uh, marriage is just a contract, right? It's a set of, right. uh, it's a predefined package of rights and responsibilities. Uh, defined as a matter of law. Uh, and I say that because I think it colors the question uh, that, that I'm asking, which is that uh, Hafen and to a certain extent yourself seem to want to um, find some kind of set of legal rights that are corporate in nature that attach to the family whatever that is. Right. And where does that come from in our legal system? The whole legal system is biased towards an individual basis for that sort of, for, for rights and responsibilities uh, and in, in a relation being controlled by contracts. So how do you conceptualize this corporate basis for, for rights? Yeah, that, that goes exactly to the, to the, the core uh, dilemma here, uh, is that uh, the rights relating to family relationships are, uh, uh, well, they can be characterized and sometimes are characterized as purely individual rights, rights of the various individual members of the family and they you know, intersect and cross each other. Uh, but, uh, uh, but it's also, uh, uh, but there is the, the reasons why the Constitution, which says, of course, in, in, in its terms, nothing about family, there's nothing that says family in the Constitution. It's just this is all, uh, you know, implied into notions of substantive liberty, uh, and uh, and so by my thinking, the reasons why family relationships are specially uh, protected, treated differently from you know a commercial relationship or something, uh, is that there is some quality to that relationship uh, that you know sets it apart from uh, from those relationships. Uh, when I, as an illustration, and I and I think with, that's part of what I think is the is the task here is to try to put our fingers on what exactly those qualities are that make it different from uh, from an ordinary commercial relationship. To give you maybe an illustration, uh, there's a, a law in Colorado uh, that was uh, enacted. Oh, maybe it's now seven years ago, uh, but a law that uh, let's see what it's called. I think it's a uh, 
be called designated beneficiaries law. It's a, a law of partnership uh, arrangement that permits uh, a couple to go down uh, to you know the county clerk's office or something and fill out a piece of paper that says we select each other to be uh, designated beneficiaries with one another. Uh, and, but the law in Colorado, this is similar to many states that have domestic partnership laws in that form. The thing that's different about Colorado's is that it permits the uh, two partners to designate differently which rights uh, they wish to extend to the other partner. So it doesn't have to be reciprocal rights. Uh, so you can check off hospital visitation privileges, uh, you know, inheritance rights, and so on, all the way down the test. But your partner may give you none of those things uh, in reply. It may be, you know, sort of a completely one-sided relationship. Well, for me, that, that sort of uh, raises the question whether that is family then at that point. If, if, if it's a relationship that is uh, sort of stripped of the things that we have known in the past that made family relationships different, which at least in my way of thinking would be sort of a durability and a, you know, obligation and commitment, uh, a sacrifice towards uh, somebody else's benefit. Uh, if the relationship has none of those things to it, uh, then, uh, then it may not deserve uh, the special constitutional uh, respect that we uh, have given to those sorts of distinctly socially beneficial uh, relationships. It is in the benefit of our species and our society to, to procreate. And I think that the basis of, of this family law is, is got to be the welfare of the child. If you take it as a commercial versus a, a familial contract, it, family law has, in a commercial contract, most of what is going on is, is bilateral. The people agree, they consent, they sign it becomes legally binding to them with whatever those parameters of that incorporation are. Family law or, or marriage that involves children, a child is a, is a, un, that is a total unilateral contract. That child had no say whatsoever in being brought into there. And I think that's where it legally that makes that leap from commercial to family law and makes that, that, that whole set of, of rights and responsibilities of those parties very different than than a corporate corporation where you have people where there is a child involved because realistically I said that child had no say in that they never signed anything you know and I think that's maybe where it makes it more a, a very different case you know so, yeah, kids do change everything mm -hmm. uh, although I would only observe that uh, that certainly uh, constitutional law as we know it has not made having a child a prerequisite to attain right, the status of right, right. so that, that. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm saying that perhaps that the difference, if you're looking at the difference in the marriage structure coming yeah. from a historical basis, right. where children are very much a part of that, to, to an evolution of where it becomes now. Well, on that note, please join me again in thanking Dean Meyer. <laughs>